started acting crazy all of a sudden. And uh, somehow that's believable because Africans, I guess, just do these things. When you think about it, it's a thoroughly racist argument that somehow ordinary people can be driven to these extraordinary lengths in a very short period of time just because they have this leadership that gets on the radio and tells them that they should do it. Now, um, um, I'm going to stop there because that's the story that you all knew, know, and that's the story I knew in 2003. In 2003, I got a call from Ramsey Clark, and uh, as one lawyer to the other, he said, you know, Peter, there's something strange going on at the Rwanda Tribunal um, because, um, uh, you know, the UN really doesn't, the Security Council really doesn't have the power to set up these tribunals. Um, the Security Council uh, has claimed that it has the power to set up tribunals, but it's not in the charter. And I just, Ramsey that is, has been arguing that um, the uh, charter, um, that the ICTR is beyond the mandate of, of the, the charter, and of course it, it is. And the, the Security Council has argued that uh, that the uh, Chapter 7 mandate gives them the power to set up tribunals to try individuals. Well, that's a set generated power that uh, came into being after the Soviet Union collapsed and the Soviet veto uh, allowed the United States and the UK and the rest of the permanent members of the Security Council to act as they will. Um, the uh, uh, so in the uh, summer of 2003, I uh, went to Arusha, Tanzania to see whether I was going to take the case. And um, when I was there, I, of course, went there with the idea that, of course, everybody knows it was the, uh, these were the good guys and the bad guys and uh, what was there to talk about. And, uh, and uh, when I was there, there was the, the chief prosecutor at a press conference. And in her press conference, um, she said that, this was Carmen Del Ponte, she said, well, I've got the evidence to prosecute the side that won the war. And, uh, um, and I'm going to move forward with these prosecutions because the side that won the war committed war crimes, the crimes against the United States, maybe that stuff. And I was you know, kind of startled. And I thought, well, gee, that's, that's really a good development because uh, you know, there's not a student of history to know that there never has been a situation where only one side committed crimes. And uh, uh, so I abused it as an advance. And then the next day, Paul Kigami had a press conference in Kigali where he called for her resignation, which made perfectly good sense to me. And uh, uh, I took it as a matter of course. And I went out to visit my potential client, and I had this conversation with this guy who was just a very warm, decent human being who was smart and erudite and loved her family and was a, apparently a very good military officer. And I, but, you know, nice people do bad things, you know. I mean, you know, Hitler loved children and he didn't eat meat, you know. Um, so I went back to the uh, uh, Impala Hotel and uh, thinking about what I was going to do, drink a cup of beer, and it's a great way to think great thoughts. And uh, a uh, press conference from Washington, D.C. was on television, and, and uh, Colin Powell was having a press conference and explaining to the world and to the press, and the press conference that they knew they were going to find weapons of mass destruction any minute now. Any minute, the weapons of mass destruction were going to turn up. And just hold on, they were coming, for sure. And someone asked them the question, well, what's going on at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, Paul Kagame called for resignation, what's the US position? He said, oh, we agree with that, and then went on. Well, of course, the world didn't pay attention to that, because nobody paid attention to the tribunal to begin with, and no one knew where Rwanda was, but it just so happened that I was in a position to pay attention. And here was the Secretary of State of the United States saying, yes, we agree that the prosecutor at the Rwanda Tribunal should be removed from office because she's announced that she's going to do her job. I nearly fell off the stool. And it wasn't because of the customers. And it was at that moment I said, you know, I think I need to take an appointment here and find out what this is about. And I didn't find out what 
was about until February of 2009, exactly what it was about. And in February of 2009, Carla Bilpante published her memoirs. And in those, she explained that about the same time that she had that press conference, she was called to the State Department by Pierre Prosper, who was the war crimes ambassador for Mr. Bush. She thought she was going to have a private meeting with the war crimes ambassador, but when she got to the State Department, she gives the room, the date, the time, all the detail. She was also uh, confronted with a delegation from the Rwanda government, and uh, Mr. Prosper and the Rwandans uh, told her that she would turn over her uh, 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 files uh, to the U.S. government and to the Rwandan government, that she would stop her prosecutions of the Rwandan government, uh, that uh, she would uh, have nothing more to do with investigating the Rwandan government, and if she didn't follow the instructions of the U.S. government, she would lose her job. And her response to Mr. Prosper, who actually had formerly been a prosecutor in the first case, first conviction at the Rwanda Tribunal, in the Yesu case, um, she, her response to him was, well, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, I work for the United Nations, not for the United States. And his response to her was, that's what you think. And uh, she was on the job two months later. That's why only one side has been prosecuted at the ICTI. And then the question is, why might that be? Well, that gets down to the story about why I was held in detention in Rwanda. Because I wasn't held in detention for anything I said or did in Rwanda, because I hadn't been in Rwanda for years. I was arrested and charged with genocide denial in Rwanda because of articles I wrote in my office in Minnesota. Because the Rwandan government has claimed not only to be able to uh, uh, criminalize criticism of the Rwandan government, but to criminalize, Rwanda, uh, criticism, but to criminalize uh, criticism of the Rwandan government anywhere in the world, and then to arrest the person who did that criticism if they happen to be on Rwanda soil, and to issue international arrest warrants for that person that can be carried out any time that person crosses a border. So the Rwandan government has now claimed the power to issue Interpol warrants for me so that whenever I travel internationally, I'm subject to arrest because of my critique of the Rwandan government, not based on what I know about the Rwandan government, but based on the documents that I'm about to explain uh, in just a moment. Because it's the documents that have gotten me in trouble the same way that Julian Assange and Wikipedia.